All right, folks, I'm going to make a start. Uh, so pray silence. Um, here we go. Let me just get the lights down and get the atmosphere and the ambience all correct. There we go. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, in this fantastic lecture theatre, which will be no more next year. This is actually going to be demolished, this lecture theatre. So this is quite a rare and special moment to be in this space with you. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next half an hour introducing you to the disciplines of sociology and criminology. And these two disciplines are very closely interrelated, very complementary, and in fact, I see myself very much as being right in between the two disciplines, as a sociologist and as a criminologist. So hopefully what Jason and I say in the next half an hour will certainly uh, inform you about what these disciplines are, what they're all about, what kind of questions they ask, what research that they do, what ways of thinking that we train you to internalize and to be able to apply to your own lives and the lives of others. I'm Dr. Gavin John Douglas Smith from the School of Sociology. I'm the deputy head of the School of Sociology. Um, so I've been around here for a little while and um, I'm gonna just say a few things about what sociology is and can be. So basically I'm gonna start off with a example as I usually do, um, which has, is a t-shirt I've just pulled up here. And the t-shirt reads, in a world where you can be anything you want, be yourself. What I want to sort of suggest um, in this talk is to raise a couple of questions, although I can't cover too much because I've got a very short time. But one of the questions is, how free are we? And what does it mean to be yourself? We very much live in an individualistic culture where we celebrate the individual and we celebrate the, we celebrate the quality of independence. And we're very much told that as individuals, we can and should shape our own destinies. As a sociologist, I want to say to you that this is a fiction, perhaps an inspiring fiction, but a fiction nonetheless. The first thing that sociologists would say and do vis-a-vis -vis this idea that we're all free as individuals, we can do what we want, we can be who we want to be, is this particular point that sociologists are very much concerned with the fact that we are transformed by the world around us and we are shaped by forces that exist beyond our control. And I'm just going to give you a brief sense of what those forces might be in what uh, I'm going to say in a little bit later. But I guess I want to just sort of say that even though you might think that you are an individual, that you are free to choose your identity, to choose your path, what sociology tells us is that that is not true. There are structural constraints and circumstances, be they the nature of the market, uh, where you are brought up and born, which family you're raised in, which school you go to, how you um, choose a particular job. These things are not all voluntarily. A lot of them are shaped by these kinds of forces, social forces that exist beyond our control. So here's an example of a couple of forces um, that are, or a couple of areas of sociology that um, are very interesting to us. Let's just start with this one up here. And who's going to give me a sense of what this is, what I've represented on the screen there? Yes, the stock market. Now, why would I say that the stock market, even though you and I have very little control over the nature and dynamics of the stock market. Why might I suggest that it nonetheless influences hugely our social experiences in everyday life? Anyone want to hazard a guess why that might be the case? Uh, I'll, any other hands first? And see if there's anybody else going to have a, have a go? OK, let's go back here. Yeah, fantastic point. So the point is that when the stock market goes wrong and crashes, the ex your everyday experiences are directly related and affected by that event. So, for example, the cost of living changes, employment rates change, how taxation operates, and mortgage repayments, and loans, and so on and so forth, and employment opportunities, all of these things are contingent on how successful or otherwise the market is. That is a lovely example of a social force, the market, the economy. How does the economy affect 
our everyday experiences and our everyday opportunities and constrain for some their potentials while enabling for others uh, their potentials. And I guess throwing up quickly uh, a slide here, this is an example of something that sociologists would be very interested in, is the unequal distribution of wealth and knowledge and its effects. Look at this picture I've put up here. If US land were divided like US wealth, 1% would own all of that much on the western states all the way through to the centre and only 9% would own this. The remaining 90% would own this. So it shows you that that particular diagram shows you that wealth is not evenly distributed and spread. It's very much concentrated in elite groups such as in uh, the, the corporate sector and people working at the very top of the corporate sector who make lots and lots and lots and lots of money and the vast majority of us do not and do not uh, have anywhere like the same opportunities and means to attain that kind of materialism. So uh, what I guess I want to say here is that some sociologists are interested in finding out about how these forces are patterned, how forces affect some people and not others. This is why religion, race, class, gender and ethnicity have become very important avenues for sociologists to consider. We're very interested in asking questions about how those kinds of factors, what uh, gender you are, what uh, race and ethnicity you come from, how these things operate to, in some ways, shape your opportunities, your life chances. To, in some ways, constrain them, in other ways, to enable them. And we're very interested in working out and explaining how uh, historical forces like colonialization, globalization, how they, as I say, act very differently on people depending on what social background they are from. Another central theme of sociology is the relationship between social norms and rules and social change. On the one hand, social norms are powerful, resistant to change and can be seen to control individuals. But on the other hand, we can see lots of examples of dramatic social change. Think about how understandings of gender roles and sexuality have changed over time and how they differ not just historically, but from region to region. If we were all together here 100 years ago, would we have so many females sitting in this lecture theatre? Yes or no? No. No, exactly. Why not? Exactly, absolutely. Gender equality has changed markedly over the past hundred years. What were women's roles previously defined as being a hundred years ago? What were they expected and socialised into doing? Yeah, be exactly. Becoming mothers. Exactly. Being framed as units of reproduction. That they should be positioned in the domestic sphere, in the home, and not part of the public sphere and public debate, and certainly not part of the university sector. We've seen huge changes on that front. It's still far from perfect, but nonetheless, we would not have had this situation 100 years back. And what I would suggest you do is even if you asked your grandparents what their experiences were like back in the day, 50, 60 years ago, whatever, however old they may be, um, I'm very confident you would find that what they would describe to you is an alien world that you don't understand anymore. Why? Because social change has happened markedly. We are interested in explaining how social change takes place uh, with what kinds of effects. And that is something that sociology is really uh, interested in. Forms of norms that try and regulate how people think and feel and act but also how individuals themselves shape society and change society and transform society. These are all key issues for sociologists. Sociology is the study of social relations and institutions, how society is organized. We're very interested in the institutions that pattern social norms and ways of thinking and acting and feeling and also how these forces shape people's lives. But also, the flip side, the inverse, how individuals like you guys, through doing degrees, coming to ANU, learning new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing, new ways of believing, how you guys go into the workforce, go into politics, go into whatever you decide to do, and transform those spaces. That is the goal of this discipline. It's a project about opening up new possibilities, as much as it's a project about understanding the nature of society and social relations. 
All I want to suggest here is that if I had to boil sociology right down to its basic, it is the study of common sense. How is it we come to agree upon certain social norms at particular times in particular spaces? How is it that that common sense acts on people in a way which ensures that some people win in society while other people lose? When I think about taking for granted knowledge, it's very much the ways in which you operate in everyday life. You see yourself, you present yourself to others. And what we do in sociology is we start to problematize some of that knowledge. We start to say, actually, some of the truths by which we live are not as stable and as certain as we believe. And this is exactly the kind of opening up of thinking critically and differently about your lives that this discipline offers and which is so exciting for people like myself who have taken a career in teaching and researching in the sociological field. What I want to just suggest here is this idea that although you think your social experiences are the same as everybody else's, what we show very much in our research is that social experiences differ significantly across nature, nations, cultures and times. And I've just put some pictures up there just briefly to illustrate very different social experiences that people are living in different periods of time in different regions of the world. And these kinds of experiences and events kind of show us that culture, that is the ways in which we tend to live our lives and think and feel and, and, and motivate us in terms of how we should act and how, what we should aspire to as ideals, that these things are very different <coughs> and uh, differently experienced as we look across different cultures and time periods historically. Now, just a couple of quick examples. I'm checking my time. I've got to be careful with my time. I've got three minutes left or so. Um, why is sociology relevant? What is this picture up here showing us on the left-hand side of the screen? What does it depict? Anybody? Yes? Lovely. Fantastic. What it depicts, beautifully illustrated, is a wall, right? An actual physical material wall which divides rich and poor, right? So on the right-hand side, we've got the flashy... Yeah, capitalist-driven materialism of people who have got lots of money, very successful in their careers, and they are living in these condos, in these secluded enclaves, these gated communities. And on the left of this giant wall, we've got people who are seriously disadvantaged, dispossessed, who probably have not had the same opportunities as those on the right to be able to flourish and realize the same kinds of material aspirations. What I'm trying to say here is one of the fundamental tenets of this discipline, why it's so exciting, is that we're interested in identifying and explaining the nature of, the circumstances of, the effects of social inequality. Because we live in take it for granted reasoning, we don't, think, we don't see these things in everyday life. We blame other people for their circumstances. What sociology shows you is that we need to move beyond thinking about the individual and think about the wider social circumstances and structure which shape how people experience their lives. Okay, so lastly, just going on to career prospects. Don't worry, you'll get all this stuff again if you come and join us in this discipline in the future and it'll be a much more extended, much more deeper understanding. But this is how sociology can enhance your career prospects. I guess the key thing I would say to you is when you come and say to me, what sociology going to do for me? I say it's going to give you critical thinking, the skills to think critically about your life and the circumstances of your life. And then when you're in the workplace, you can start to see patterns in that occupational setting, which are very, very valuable and beneficial to employers. You are able to reflect on how things are and imagine how they could be otherwise, how they could be different. That is the kind of tools that we will give you if you study this discipline. Why study sociology at ANU? Very quickly, ANU, as you all know, is Australia's leading university for sociology, and it's one of the best in the world, according to recent rankings, and I'm very proud of that fact. Our teachers are renowned in the world of sociological research and are prize winners for outstanding teaching practice. Our graduates find employment in a wide variety of interesting areas and vocations. And employers are constantly saying to me, sociology is incredibly valuable 
way of thinking and skill to have in the workplace because it enables people to think independently, to think for themselves and not just passively follow the rules. That's my time up, so I better stop, eh? Um, just lastly, as I pass over to my fabulous colleague, Jason Payne, I just want you to give you a sense of the kinds of courses you'll uh, be able to be exposed to at the ANU if you take sociology. And you can see all of these different areas, which are very exciting, studying the media, studying social theory, studying contemporary China, inequality, risk society, surveillance, my own research area, you'll be very much exposed to these things. So without further ado, thank you for your time and patience, and hope to see you again. Cheers.